Good morning, everybody. I want to welcome you to the state of Mount Calvary United Methodist Church. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen, church? And brothers and sisters, it's, it's good to be back with you. I'm grateful for Owen Housen filling in for me last week. I, I've got nothing but positive reports from his, uh, his message and just his leadership last week, and so I'm definitely grateful for having the chance to go away and put things in trust with him. A few announcements as we get started this morning, friends. Uh, first is, <coughs> pardon, next week is our um, spring mission trip to Clark's Summit. Penzi, is there still time to sign up if people want to? Okay, great. So if you would like to go up, even for just a day, um, to Clark Summit, you maybe can't take a whole week off of work, but if you want to go for even just a day to be helpful, um, you can see Penzi, and she'd love to be able to help you coordinate how to make that possible. All of our regular Sunday school classes are on, Sunday school classes and Bible studies are on for this week. Uh, next week, well, I guess in a little over a week, we have the Election Day Cafe. There's still lots of things to sign up for regarding food donations and volunteer hours. Um, and there's two things not in the bulletin. But the first is a week from yesterday, so on the 20th, we're doing a big church cleanup around the property. Um, the trustees have organized this, and we can use all the help that we can get. It's going to start at 9 a.m. And uh, if you would like to be able to help, um, if you would contact Matt Luttrell, if you can in advance, because then he can know where to sort of assign you as a station here around the property. And know that would be a huge help to us for a week from yesterday, in six days. And then lastly, tonight we are starting season four of The Chosen here at Mount Calvary. We are going to be watching it here in the sanctuary. And so all are invited to uh, check that out. I will say, if you have not seen seasons one and one through three, you're more than welcome to come. We'd love to have you. It will be a little bit of a catching up curve for you, but it's still just an awesome show that allows us to see uh, a lot of what it was to experience what the disciples experienced 2,000 years ago. So we got a lot of stuff going on, folks. Are there any other announcements to be made this morning? Seeing none, then let us go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're grateful this morning for the chance to just worship you, Jesus. You've given, given us a beautiful day, and that beautiful day speaks into our hearts and so today, Lord, as we seek to know you more through our singing, through our praying, through scripture, through all it is that we do, God, may your love become a centerpiece in our hearts so that we could find true peace. We pray these things in your name, Jesus, and all of God's children say, amen.
Thank you, Barb. And this time is our chance to make a joyful noise, brothers and sisters. So let's stand as we join together in our opening hymn this morning, Thine Be the Glory. Amen. You may be seated. And I'd like to invite any children forward for children's time this morning. All right. Good morning, kiddos. How are you guys today? You guys are my quiet bunch. That's okay. Let, let, let's try this. Does anybody know who I am? For legit, let's try this. Who, who am I? Somebody answer. Yes. I'm Jim. Okay, I'm Jim. Very good. So am I also a pastor? Okay. Does anybody know my last name? This is a challenge. Yeah? Copulous. Very, very good. Do you know my middle name? You shouldn't. Fun fact, my middle name is Robert, which means I'm Jim Bob. Oh, well. <laughs> I don't forgive my parents for that. So, I'm telling you I'm Jim. I'm telling you I'm Jim Copulous. I'm telling you that I'm pastor. But how do you know I'm telling you the truth? Yeah? Because I'm at church talking to everyone. That's a good clue. That's a good clue. Clearly, I have some sort of authority here that's very good. So I say that because the truth is, if you guys have never met me before, I could tell you I'm anybody. And you may believe it. You may not. But there's different ways that we can identify ourselves. You just picked up a great one, Whitney. Like, I'm clearly doing what it is my job says that I do. But there's other ways that we can identify ourselves. So if somebody wanted to know who an adult was? What's something that they could ask for, ask to see? Yeah. You asked my name, but how would you know that is my name? Yeah. You see if I have a badge. I like that. So 
adults have badges, but we call them driver's licenses. So you can see that, like, I am Pastor Jim. Well, it doesn't say pastor on there, but you can see that I am Jim. This is my uh, driver's license badge. And badge, I just said badge. This is my driver's license. And one of the things you guys will notice, and you'll understand this when you grow up too, is that everyone's driver's license picture is awful. It's just awful. <laughs> if you have a good driver's license picture, you're a very special person. When I go to the doctor, they ask for identification too, but they ask for more than my driver's license. They ask for this. This is called a health insurance card. And this is a very important card because this helps the doctors to know how much I have to pay for my medical care and how much my insurance pays. Hopefully the insurance pays a lot more than I have to pay. There's other different forms of identification we have. We all have birth certificates. Have you guys ever seen your birth certificates? Did you know you have a birth certificate? There's a paper that says your mommy and daddy were so and so on it. Some of us have special membership cards, like I have a card to Costco that um, has my picture on it. So there's lots of different ways that we can identify each other. 2,000 years ago, Jesus died, and when he resurrected, he showed up to his friends, the disciples. And when he showed up, bless you. And when he showed up, they got so scared because the last time that they had seen him, he had died. And he showed them something to let them know that he was really who he said he was. Does anybody, can anybody think of what he might show them? Did he have a driver's license? And he was like, hi, this is my driver's license from the year 33 AD. I'm allowed to drive this horse? Probably not. Do you think Jesus had an ancient Jerusalem Costco membership? Probably not. But sometimes we can tell who we are by marks that we have. Like, Ava, you have beautiful red hair. You are definitely your mother's daughter. I know that for a fact. And so we have different markings on us that can show that we belong to certain people. What do you think Jesus could have shown his disciples? What markings would have been special on him? When he went to the cross, what happened to him? How did he end up on the cross? Did he just stand up there and was like, I'm here. How did he stay up there? You guys know how Jesus stayed up there? Yeah. Nails. Very good, Wyatt. And so Jesus shows his friends the holes in his hands and a hole in his side where the, he had a spear stuck into him when he was killed. And so they're able to know that he was really him by the markings he had on him. Now, you can know who I am because of all the things I showed you. The disciples knew who Jesus was by the marks on his hands and in his side. How can people know that you four are Christians? Do you have an ID card that says, I believe in Jesus on you? No. Do you have any sort of markings on you that show that you are, believe in Jesus? Hopefully you don't have hands, holes in your hands. What are ways that people can maybe know that you are a Christian? They could say, oh, that girl, that boy's a Christian. Yeah. They see you praying. That's very, very good. Is there any other ways that maybe they would know you're a Christian if they saw you? What if you were reading from a special book? Is there a special book that we can read that maybe people will be like, oh, you're a Christian? Ava, what do you think? The Bible, very good, very good. And maybe if one day your friends are like, hey, can we hang out? You're like, no, I have to go to church. Then they would know you're a Christian. And so what's important, guys, is that we don't want to hide who we are from anyone. We want everybody to know who we are and who we believe in, because that's the most important thing for folks to know, that we believe in Jesus. We're not going to have an ID card that says, I, Wyatt, am a Christian. But we can do it by the way that we treat others, the way that we pray, and the way that we show love. So let's fold our hands, speaking of prayer, bow our heads, and repeat after me. God, I love you. And I know you love me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty, get us lollipop time. Mia, I love your shoes. I should get a pair of those for Mia. Alrighty, guys, we come now to share our prayer requests. 
and our praises to our Lord Jesus Christ. You may not have realized it, but I'm wearing a mask for a lot of the service today. I know, you didn't notice, I'm sure. Um, I was sick last week. I thought it was just a cold, but um, Amanda has come down with a pretty rough case of COVID, so I'm presuming that's what I had last week. So want to just be a little bit safe with y'all, so I'll be just waving to you guys after the service is over today. But I ask that you would keep her in prayer because she's, she's been, it's, it's not just one of those, hey, I think I have it, I don't have it. She's been pretty sick, so I appreciate your prayers for that. But I know there's lots of other things to be in prayer about as well, and um, if you haven't been following the news, um, you, would have, you, you may have missed this, but yesterday, um, there was an attack on Israel from Iran in response to Israel bombing an Iranian consulate in Syria. And so 99% of the attack was um, able to be dispelled and deflected from uh, Ira- uh, the uh, Israelis and other uh, forces supporting them. But we definitely want to keep this region in the Middle East in prayer. It is becoming quite the powder keg at this moment. And most importantly, we want to be centered and focused on peace Um, which is actually the theme of our message this morning. Other prayers or praises to lift up today? Yes, Bart. Your mom is turning 85 on Saturday, and she should be watching now. Gloria Knoll is turning 85 on Saturday, so happy birthday, Gloria, we're so glad you're watching, and I'm sure you're grateful that your daughter just did this. So, (laughs) 49, 49, okay. Now we're getting a little bit better. So, happy birthday, Gloria. Hope you have a great one. Make sure your daughter gives you the best meal ever. You want me to sing happy birthday to her? Oh, do the thing. This is what you get. Now you have to get out of your penalty box. (laughs) All righty. Now get back in your box. (laughs) <laughs> Other prayers are praise. Yes, Bob. Good golly. Well, we'll definitely keep your sister in prayer for her seventh cornea transplant. Please remind us of her name, Bob. Jean. Jean Elizabeth, we want to keep Jean in prayer. Um, We also want to keep the family of Shirley Dieter in prayer. I'm sure most of you heard that Shirley went on to glory, uh, and um, we just want to lift up her family. We had a beautiful, beautiful service for her um, this past week. I also actually, this uh, this reminded me, I want to lift up in prayer. Tomorrow I'm doing a funeral for an individual who's not from our community. Um, There's only anticipated to be one person uh, there. I think it's his brother at the service. And so just prayers for this individual's uh, loved one that's going to be uh, alone celebrating this indi- their, his brother's life tomorrow. Others to share. No? Okay. What? Yeah, Becky. I looked at that up. I looked up Israel and Iran. Yeah, and what's going on over there. Absolutely. We do want to continue to keep that in prayer. Absolutely. Thank you, Becky. Well, seeing no others at this time, it's our opportunity to give our offering to the Lord, both in song, in offering financially, and also with prayer requests. So if you need a prayer request that you didn't want to say out loud, you want me to pray for, you can fill it out and place it onto a card. And as we sing this song, you're invited to place those cards and your offering into the plates down front.
stand. Father, take these offerings and multiply them to your will. Lord, use these to expand the ministries of Mount Calvary United Methodist Church. And also take these prayers and let us put our trust in you and discover perfect peace that you offer when we give all things to you in prayer. Thank you for receiving this today, God, and for what you will do with it. We pray these things in your name. And all God's children say, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And this time we have a celebration from our choir.
choir. Thank you so much for that. At this time, children may be dismissed to CCT, and I'd like to invite Lynn Trojak forward with our scripture reading this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Please stand for the reading of God's holy word. A reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 36 through 48. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking that they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh or bones, as you see I have. When, they had, when he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and, and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all the nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of all these things. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Lynn. You may be seated. <clears throat> Let us pray. Heavenly Father, on this day, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer, may these be your words, O oh God, not mine. Amen. <clears throat> So I'll start this morning with a bit of a confession. There's something that I really wrestle with, and that is envy. It's always been a struggle for me, but not for <clears throat> the kinds of things that a lot of people are envious of. I don't struggle with envy with regards to like people having more material possessions than me. I'm, I'm content with the things that God has blessed me with materially. The place where I tend to wrestle with envy is when I see folks who have certain aspects of their faith figured out in ways that I wish I could get to. Now, the Lord gifts us in very different ways, and I understand that, but particularly for those folks that are able to find peace in the midst of cha the chaos of life, which is something that I very much struggle with, I tend to be envious and think to myself, wow, just look at that example right there. I hope one day that I can be and live a little bit like that, a little bit more like that. And it's always the kinds of folks that, at least from my perspective, that surprise me, that I don't anticipate having the kind of faith, that kind of relationship with God, and then yet it just comes out in ways that can be inspirational and even transformative. Most of you are aware that last weekend I was away at a wrestling bonanza. I was at uh, 12 wrestling events in four days, so it was a good start and uh, had a wonderful, wonderful experience. But one of the shows that I was most looking forward to, there was a wrestler there uh, on it named Mark Briscoe. And uh, I'll show you a picture of him. He's a very handsome young man. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, the kind you want to take home to your daughters. But Mr. Briscoe, um, the reason I was interested in seeing him wrestle is because a year and a half ago, his brother, his tag team partner of a very, very long period, was tragically killed in a car accident. His name is Jay, and Jay was driving his two daughters to cheerleading practice when somebody in the opposite lane had some kind of a cardiac event and drove straight head on into them, killing her and killing Jay immediately. It also left Jay's daughters with significant injuries. His 12-year-old daughter had a fracture in her L3 and L5 and no movement below her knees. His younger daughter suffered a C7 break in her neck, a broken tibia and fibula, 
damage to her lower spine and a perforated bowel and a broken rib. So substantial, awful injuries to these two young girls. And in the midst of that tragedy, what was kind of amazing to see was though the family was deeply in mourning and fear of what was going to happen, no matter what you read, and especially from this individual, the deceased's brother, it was all about trusting God, giving the glory to God, and finding peace with God. Mark would say in one interview, if I didn't know that Jay wasn't with God in the arms of the Savior, Jesus Christ, if I didn't know that, then there's no way I could go on right now. And then speaking to another, uh, in another interview, Mark said this, lives are going to be changing. Souls are going to be saved. You understand? I know one thing. When I do stand there with him face to face again, there's going to be a rack of souls. There's going to be thousands, tens of thousands, whatever it may be, that are going to be up there on the other side of the pearly gates right there with us because of what has happened this past week. You see, he believed that Jay's death would ultimately lead to more people coming to know the faith because of the testimony that he and the rest of his family would have a chance to share, and I do believe that that's true. That's the kind of thing I'm talking about. I don't know how I would go about that same kind of experience, especially as a public figure. And yet, a beautiful example of how someone can find peace in the midst of chaos in their life. This morning's scripture, we read about Jesus encouraging peace in a moment of chaos with his disciples. You would think this would be the most joyous moment that they have had. Jesus had resurrected, and he, he is appearing. <clears throat> he's appearing to them for the first time. They've been told he was back, but they hadn't seen him for themselves. And so he shows up and very, I imagine, calmly and joyfully says, peace be with you. And what is their response? Ah! It's a ghost! But Jesus knows they have the ability to find peace. Do we have the ability to find peace even in the midst of the chaos? Do we have the ability to find peace even when things seem overwhelming? Do we have the ability to find peace even when it just doesn't make sense? Well, that's what we need to think about this morning, church. And we need to understand that, that Jesus wants us to know that peace is born when fear is overcome. Again, the scriptures tell us that they were startled and frightening, thinking they saw a ghost. It's a ghost. Interestingly, there's only two places, or two stories in the Bible, I should say, where uh, the concept of a ghost is mentioned. The first one actually occurs when the disciples see Jesus walking on water. They're battling, they're battling the winds on the sea. They can't make any progress, and they're frustrated, they're exhausted, they're probably frightened. And then all of a sudden they see this figure coming at them walking on the water, which I will confess, I'd probably be with them there. <laughs> like, that's a ghost. I don't even believe in ghosts. But that's a ghost. <laughs> That doesn't make sense. And they get scared, and then Jesus tells them who he is and, and gets in the boat, and he calms the seas. It's interesting, their fear began when they couldn't succeed in their rowing, but the moment that they defined their fear by their need to be in control, nothing else was going to make sense. But when they listen to Jesus in that story, he gets in the boat with them, and peace reigns. This is the second time that a ghost is mentioned. And again, their fear began when Jesus was crucified. They saw him die. They know he was in that tomb. And so the foundation of who they are, their existence in that moment was defined by fear. Fear of what had happened to Jesus, fear of what might happen to them, fear of what the future could hold. But when they choose to listen to Jesus, that is when fear is overcome and peace begins to set in for the disciples. When I think about the kind of things that keep me from feeling a sense of peace, it's those things that keep me up at night, that I kind of dwell on, that I kind of think about. You know, I think if you look at maybe the reasons why you have a sleepless night, some of us it's, it's physical, but I think for a lot of us it's that emotional, that that concern about what's going on in the world, what's going on with my family, what's going on with myself. When those issues of anxiety 
raise up, it becomes more and more difficult to discover that perfect peace that God offers us. Because all we can think about is what could happen. The search for peace will never end for folks who define their lives by what it is they're afraid of. But peace can come when we don't worry about what could happen, but we look at what we know is going to happen. That we have a fact in our lives that's very important, church, and that is no matter what it is we face in this life, if we believe in Jesus Christ, we have a greater glory that's coming. Amen? Amen. But you guys are more awake than the kids were. Good, I was kind of counting on that this morning. Jesus tells us in the Gospel of John, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And in the middle of that passage is important. Sometimes when we become Christians, we think to ourselves, everything gets easy, everything's hunky-dory, everything's just how we imagine it in heaven. But the reality is, the stronger we grow in our faith, the more challenges we're going to face by the evils of this world. So we will have troubles. But as long as we have the future that we know about in focus, we can have peace. It may not make a lot of sense, but the reality is, is that peace thrives when wisdom is set aside. Even after they realize who Jesus is, and they kind of figure out he's not a ghost. You know, eventually he asks them for something to eat, and it's like, look, a ghost wouldn't want fish. A ghost would want burgers. No, a ghost wouldn't eat the way that I'm going to eat. But here we see that while they still did not believe it, because joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything to eat? Now, I'm going to assume here that if I look deeper into the Greek translation of this passage, that when it says they didn't believe it, this is more like, it's not like they doubted. It's more like, I can't believe what I'm seeing. This is amazing. It even says they're in amazement here. But nevertheless, we tend to feel this way when we experience things that don't make sense based on the way that we understand the natural world is meant to look. And so, indeed, we can struggle to find peace when things just don't make sense in the way that we are told they are meant to make sense. This is an area that a lot of folks wrestle with when it comes to their faith. You know, most folks acknowledge that Jesus of Nazareth existed. Even atheists who are historians, almost all of them will tell you, it's a fact that there was a man named Jesus of Nazareth who ex existed 2,000 years ago. They'll even tell you that he taught a lot of what we read about in the scriptures, because obviously these concepts have developed over the last two millennia. But when it comes to the miraculous, when it comes to the supernatural, Becky Griffiths taught me the, world, the word, the supernaturality of God. I never heard that before I met you. I like that. But that's where folks struggle. One of our presidents was one of them, Thomas Jefferson. You know, Jefferson had what was called Jefferson's Bible. It was completed in 1820, and basically he cut with a very fine razor and pasted with glue numerous sections of the New Testament as extraction to the doctrine of Jesus. And Wikipedia says Jefferson's condensed composition excludes all the miracles by Jesus and most mentions of the supernatural, including sections of the four Gospels that contain the resurrection and most other miracles and passages that portray Jesus as divine. Jefferson loved the teachings of Jesus, but he wasn't quite sure about all that stuff that doesn't make sense from a worldly perspective. And he could only see Jesus by the limitations of human wisdom. Jesus was a wise teacher, but nothing more. Interestingly, a couple hundred years later, a man named C.S. Lewis would live. And he wrote the books The Chronicles of Narnia, The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe. I'm sure most of you at least heard of those, if not read or seen the movies. He also was an atheist who was converted to the faith. And Lewis would develop something he called his trilemma. Dilemma is two, tri is three. And Lewis would write this. I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That's one thing we cannot say about Jesus. 
A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He'd either be a lunatic on the level with the man who would say that he is a poached egg. I am a poached egg. You're clearly a lunatic, sir. Or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Now it seems to me obvious that he was neither a lunatic nor a fiend, and consequently, however strange or terrifying or unlikely it may seem, I have to accept the view that he was and is God. You see, when we accept the fact, and I do mean the fact, that Jesus is exactly who he said he was, it opens a very important door to the supernatural aspects of our faith. This means that we're able to take our trust of God to a unique and beautiful place that goes beyond anything the world has ever and will ever offer to us. It means that importantly, we can take Jesus seriously when he says things like this. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. How many of us this morning are looking for something like that? Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid something troubling your heart today? Is there something you're afraid of? Someone who's sick, wondering if that paycheck's going to cover that bill. Not sure if I'm ever going to find love. God tells us that we can turn to him and discover, even in the midst of struggling with those questions, a peace that surpasses all understanding. And you see, peace can only be cemented in our hearts when Christ becomes the foundation. Jesus understands this when he's with the disciples in this moment, that now that they've experienced the resurrection, now that they've seen him, now that they've fed him, then now they're going to understand what it means to take the next steps. And so when Jesus says, you're witnesses to these things, it's not just telling them, you were witness to these things, and they go, oh yeah, that's great. It's that now they have to go and tell others about it. And that's going to be a tumultuous experience. Literally, at the end of the day, all the disciples will be martyred, except for one, as time goes on. But in the midst of that journey, Jesus doesn't want them to convey a spirit of anxiousness, a spirit of worry. He wants everyone that the disciples encounter and everyone that we encounter today as people who claim to be Christians to see in us that we can find peace, no matter what it is we may be facing. In this moment, Christ became the foundation of their lives. And suddenly, what they were most afraid of, their own mortality, no longer had power over them because the peace of eternity was always going to be ahead of them, no matter what it is they may have faced. And the same is true for us today, church. We have to worry about our mortality because the kingdom of heaven promises us an eternity with immortality. It can allow us to be the kind of people that can inspire others, that can live as an example of people of peace, a people of faith, a people that trust in ways that go beyond the understanding of others, even other Christians like myself who at times wrestle or even envious to see that kind of faith because they want to have that experience for themselves. But the amazing thing is God can always open our hearts to grow in those areas as well. I started today by telling you about the uh, that handsome young fella, Mark Briscoe, that you saw on your screens earlier today. I mentioned that, you know, he's so handsome, you like to take him home to your daughters, but he's married, he has seven kids, his eighth is on the way. Lord in your mercy, be with his wife. 
But when I got to the show that I wanted to see him at, I was very blessed. Some of you were following me on Facebook as I took this journey, but I got to the arena and it wasn't very well sold. And so I actually asked someone if I could move up and basically they told me as long as there's an empty seat, you can take that seat. And so that resulted in me over the next two hours sitting in a seat and when someone would show up, I would say, oh, hi, I'm just a seat filler. Please have your seat. And then moving down to the next section until I got down to the very bottom. And at the end of the show, <clears throat> it was a very emotional moment because Mark was wrestling for the world championship of that organization. And it was the 11-year anniversary of the date in which his brother had won that same championship. So there was a lot of emotions. His whole family was at the event, and all the ideas and all the thoughts of what had gone on over the past year and a half. Thankfully, Jay's daughters were able to regain their ability to walk and are beginning to get back their normal functionality of life. But at the end of the show, Mark won the championship, and it was a full, full pouring out of emotion, which is so funny to see over something that's fake but at the same time, something very real for a family that was going through something very real. At that point, I had been fortunate enough to actually get down to the very front, to the rail, where uh, <clears throat> the show was happening. And I shot a picture that just, the Lord just blessed me with, that I just thought was perfect for what I had seen and what a lot of folks in the arena were experiencing. And it's just, you know, Mr. Briscoe just holding that belt, and I don't know how I got the lights. To, to be like that. But I mean, you want to talk about somebody that was trying to do something for somebody who's in the kingdom of heaven, that'll open your eyes a little bit. And at the very end of the show, Mark was walking around high-fiving people, and I just happened to be in the spot to be able to receive a high-five. And as he uh, walked past me, everybody was saying, congratulations, this is awesome, congratulations. And he high-fived me, and I don't know why I said this, but I just said, Praise the Lord. And it was so funny because he stopped for a second and he looked at me and he took a step back and he just said, pointed to heaven and he just said, he's the one who gets all the glory. Man. I just got chills. To go through everything that family had gone through, to be able to point your finger to heaven and say, he's the one who gets all the glory. That's what happens when we allow fear to be set aside and peace to reign in our hearts. I mentioned it earlier, church, but the scriptures tell us, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends, surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Friends, this is not just something that is out there for a select few. It's available to all of us, this unique and beautiful and special peace. And much like Christ's salvation, all we have to do is receive it. All we have to do is accept that it's there for us, to take it in, to say, yes, God, I want your peace. Doesn't mean the world gets easier. <clears throat> because remember, Jesus even says there's troubles in the world. But we know he'll overcome them, and he'll help us to overcome them as well. So today, I just say to you, if you struggle with peace, God is ready to offer it. If you are ready to open your heart to it, and this goes to me first, because remember, I struggle. But I can tell you this. God can use anyone in any moment in any situation to bring about a unique form of peace in our lives and let us know exactly what it is that we're capable of and how strong we are to overcome even the most challenging of situations. Even a handsome young fellow like Mark Briscoe can show us such faith. Guess what, guys? He's no different than the rest of us. All of us can live with that peace. May it be so today. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Jesus, Prince of Peace, we're all going through different things in our lives, Lord. Some of us are going through a fairly sublime time, an easier couple of days, weeks, months, years. Some of us have been gone through the ringer, Lord. And some of us who think we're going through the ringer, when we look at the world, we realize our ringer ain't that ringy. 
God, I pray today, no matter who it is or where it is or what it is that we're experiencing, that we could seek your peace, receive what you offer to us, and let that be what defines who we are. Not fear, not worry, not the troubles of this world, but simply you. And Jesus, this morning, in honor of you, we join together in the Lord's Prayer and sing, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I invite us to stand now as we now join in the Apostles' Creed. <clears throat> I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's remain standing for our closing hymn this morning, church. Go make all of all disciples. Some of you will know what to say in response to this. Peace be with you. I invite you to go this day in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, taking the peace of Christ with you. Go in peace and serve the Lord and remember that God loves you and there is nothing you can do about it. Amen.